Hello everyone and welcome to another episode of Mark's English History Channel. Today this episode is about is one of the series on the walk in the Somme battlefield. And this episode is coming to you from a place or a section of the battlefield in between near to the village of La Bacelle. So La Bacelle is down there behind us. You can just see the church tower sticking out over the top of the trees. And beyond on the far side of La Bacelle is the uh, famous Loch Nagar mine crater which was blown on the 1st of July 1916. However what we've done is we've come through the village and then up this little track and the reason I'm up here is because I'm going to walk a line of an advance that have occurred here on the 13th of July 1916. Now this line of advance that we're going to walk is, bit, is actually quite personal to me because this, this the regiment that was charged with making this advance was the 13th Battalion of the Rifle Brigade. Now the 13th Battalion of the Rifle Brigade is, what, is the regiment in which my great grandfather fought. So I'm actually walking in his footsteps today. Um, it was a bit of a disaster um, in the, the assault as we head towards where we're going. So to give you a bit more of an orientation, another cell is just behind us and then behind that is the, t is the town of Albert. Running along in front of us as we stand here, which is just to the left, to the left of La Bacelle as we came out of it, is the Albert Bapone Road. So um, through the village there, I believe that's Alvarez, in front of us, and then around here, the the woods you see in front, that's a, that's a modern plantation. So that that is significant to the battlefield and then just to the right of us just off the dip of this grass fur of, of the field that we're standing in is and you can see a car moving along that's the road between La Bacelle down towards Contamazon so that's that's the area in which we're in a V-shape as you can see now that there's vehicles moving along the Albert Bapone road at the far end of this field is a is a sunken trackway and it got the name Dead Man's Lane and that's the posi Dead Man's Lane is a position where the Germans are in at the time. So before we go any further though, I have got an I've got the copy of the regimental history. So I'm just going to read you the extract about the attack on this day. On the ten on July 10th, a date memorable in the in the history of the 13th Rifle Brigade. We were in the front line as part of the 34th Division and the disposition of the companies was D Company on the left of the tramway line with C Company in support, A Company on the right with B Company in support. Our position was heavily shelled during the day and the casualty list grew in a, in a few hours by another 70 killed or wounded. At 8.15 that evening, word was passed along that the battalion would launch an attack on the German trenches in a half an hour's time and run was issued to all the troops now standing by with their chin straps of their steel helmets pulled out pulled taut and the gas marks in, in the alert men glanced at one another and, and with a brave smile many tried hard to conceal their reaction to the dreadful ordeal just announced a middle-aged chap would say to his fellow cheerio mate H hope is a brighty for both of us while a young chubby faced fellow we we'll start talking about something which had nothing to do with the war. At last, exactly at 8.45, the CO's whistle gave the signal and the trench began to empty, with DNA companies leading the way. Men were moving towards the German line, just as they did at High Wycombe and on Salisbury Plain. Shows were bursting all around, the shrapnel descending like rain and high explosives crashing and spouting up great black fountains of earth, while hidden machine guns by the dozen poured out their pitiless streams of lead. The advancing lines of khaki were now being thinned at every yard, but the gaps filled up quickly and the dauntless survivors pressed on until at last they battered their way into the German front line. Then, with the position won in a frightful cost, came the news that the assault was all a mistake. Attack cancelled, said a message received by the colonel, as he followed behind his men. So the order was given to retire, and those who remained alive had to thread their way back again through a second inferno, over the dead and over the wounded who had been left behind. 
Now in the trench from which the attack began, small squads of men were closing up to answer a hurried roll call. Gradually more men drifted in and the number of survivors increased, but alas the total was appallingly small. Some days afterwards, when the casualty lists were made up, all the hospital and all the hospitals had rendered their reports, the losses were assessed. At 20 officers and 380 other ranks, the CO and the adjutant had been wounded, the second in command was missing, three of the company commanders had been killed while, while the fourth was on his way to the casualty clearing station. The medical officer was dead, acting RSM Croucher, severely wounded, and the whole platoons of men had been completely wiped out. The officers who had taken part in that valiant but fruitless adventure, from the colonel down to the youngest subaltern, were greatly admired by their men, and no unit of the British Army had ever had a better conception of discipline or a more profound experience of comradeship. It was said truthfully of the officers who went into action on the Somme with the 13th Rifle Brigade that they were all soldiers and gentlemen, and those who died in the attack of the 10th of July 10th will be remembered with affection till the last of the riflemen went over the top on that fateful evening has himself been dismissed from his last parade. The death of such men of men such men as Major Sir Foster Cuncliffe and Captain G. W. Smith was a severe blow to the world of learning as well as the battalion for both of these has been distinguished colours. Before the war Captain Smith was elected in the Department of Zoology. and comparative anatomy at Oxford and his monograph dealing with his research expeditions to the antipod gained him a permanent place in the records of natural science. Sir Foster Tunnick Cuncliffe's diary contained the last thoughts as he lay slowly dying in a shell hole was probably the most moving document ever received from the battlefield, almost as beautiful and poignant as its phrase in a Scots final message from the South Pole. When the battalion had returned from its terrible experience, there came to mind of each survivor a cynical and lasting impression of the true significance of modern warfare. Men stood in little groups brooding on the, brooding on the tragedy and caring not what happened next. Many still wore an ashen grey look, their eyes revealing a half-demented mind. More than one was pondering on the fate of a loved brother, perhaps still alive or out there in some ditch filled with dead comrades. Colonel Preeter Pinney, although wounded, remained in command until the last of the stragglers came in, when he reluctantly agreed to go back to the big dressing station down in the town of Albert. There he remained for a time, a prophetic figure that habituated calm of his changed into unchecked emotion, with tears streaming down the face. He kept repeating, what a mess I've made of my battalion. So we're now going to walk that line of advance made by the 13th Battalion of the Rifle Brigade on the, on the 10th of July 1916. And I hope you don't mind, but whilst I walk this, I'm actually not going to make any commentary. Um, I'm just going to let the ambient noise come through um, as we experience the walk that that regiment made on that fateful morning.
to the large cemetery that you can see off to the left at about 11 o'clock, 10 o'clock-ish and then the village slightly round to the right of that um, about half past 10 that's the village and the cemetery of the town of Poitiers which was taken by the Australians as a major part of the Battle of the Somme and a way in which to try to outflank the German positions back on the Tietval Heights which are back to our back to our left behind us. This action by the 13th Battalion of the Rifle Brigade was one of the opening stages of that assault onto the German positions uh, of Poitiers. The Battle of Poitiers holds the distinction of being the only real sub-battle of the Battle of the Somme that holds its own name. There's potentially up to 19 different battles that are fought in what we consider to be the Battle of the Somme. And yet Poitiers is the only one that sort of has it, is a battle on that all, all to itself. Mainly because of the, um, the pushing and insistence of the Australian government to honour the sacrifice of their soldiers in the village or in the capture of the village.
Because as these trees weren't here at the time of the battle, and for later on, so I'm just going to turn this film off for the moment, and I'll restart it once we come out the other side. We've come around the little plantation, and we're looking across now, you can get a nice close up view there of the Poziers Cemetery. And then we're looking across to Dead Man's Lane here. Um, this is where the pathway of the track that I started walking up has ended and it bends back into the trees and looks like it heads back to the road, the uh, Contamazon Road. So I'm not going to continue um, across the farmer's field as much as I would like to, to Dead Man, into Dead Man's Lane. Um, the farmers on the Somme are actually quite respectable in terms of allowing you to walk on tracks and things around the side of their fields, exploring the battlefields, but it's pushing the limits to actually go out into fields with crops in. So I'm going to continue following the road round and then when I get back to the car, uh, my next stop is in Contamazon, so I'll drive up to and um, hopefully there'll be somewhere that I can pull over and have a walk down Dead Man's Lane to examine the German, what would have been the German position that the 13th rifle brigades broke into on that fateful morning um, but I hope you enjoyed watching that I must admit there's a couple of times walking across there I did start to feel a bit emotional myself um, I never met my great grandfather but it, um, it certainly made me think of my nan um, who was his daughter um, as we came across there so um, I hope you enjoyed that one that was, I'd say that was a, a personal one for me and it gives you an insight into maybe all the 13th Rifle Brigade were a famous regiment at the time, one that's maybe slipped a little bit into obscurity, and also to see a and do a walk of an advance on the Somme that most people don't get to do. They often do, for example, the advance of the Newfoundlanders at Newfoundland Park or the 29th Division at Newfoundland Park but this gives you an opportunity, gave me an opportunity to walk one that um, I wouldn't normally like to do and I'd like to give a shout out here um, to Paul Reed's The Old Front Line podcast because it was a, a few months ago um, when I was planning on coming over again this, 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 this year um, that I was at home, I'd done an early shift uh, in, my pr uh, in my job at the airport um, so I normally got home, I was always too tired to read so I just used to play his podcast and one day I just ventured upon a po uh, on his podcast where he actually walked this route himself and so I listened to that and it sort of, I, I, I got my maps out and worked out where it was so I decided when I was booked to come over it was one of the first things in my itinerary so just like to say thank you to Paul for, um, for for doing that episode and allowing me to walk in my great grandfather's footsteps. Plantation, which was a bit um, harder to find my way out of than I thought it was going to be. Um, <laughs> but we're now back on the Contamaze on La Bastel Road and just over to the left, um, about 10 o'clock you've got Golden Dump Cemetery. So that's where I'm heading off to next. Um, I don't know 100%, but where soldiers pretended to be brought, who were killed, tended to be brought in and buried in cemeteries quite close by, um, I would imagine that there would be a few from the 13th Rifle Brigade buried in there. Um, just beyond, about now about 10 o'clock because I've moved out the road a bit um, you can see the coaches over there that's the, and, and the ground slightly rising that's the ground crater at La Bicelle, um which was I say it was blown on the 1st of July and it was attacked by the Tyneside Irish and the Tyneside Scottish um, however it became an absolute nightmare so it took if you can see the distance it's, it's hardly any distance at all it took 10 days to clear that area so you can see just how um, how slow warfare had become and as you move on from the Battle of the Somme through into 1917 up until the Germans break out of the trench systems in in the spring of 1918 
certainly the battles that you find up in, up in Flanders around places like Messines and at the third battle of Ypres around places like Passchendaele that the, this idea of one great big push that would break the German line and thus break the army had actually gone from the generals thinking it was instead you get um, General Curry, the Canadian general, start to br bring in a system of what he called bite and hold, where you where they bought, bit into the German defensive line, held that, consolidated it, and then did it, and, and then bit in a bit further, and that's that starts to actually develop here on the Somme it, during the latter part of it. After once you start, once we move beyond and start looking at actions that occur beyond the 1st of July. This idea of one big push, and in the words of Blackadder, it's on the Berlin for ice cream and biscuits, was kind of, wasn't in the, in the tactical thinking by that stage. Um, it was at first a big push just to break out into country. Uh, one of the reasons why Haig wasn't convinced about fighting the battle here on the Somme to begin with is that behind the Somme there's not many tactical objectives that he could use whereas up in Flanders the tactical objective would be to take the channel ports that were giving the U-boats operations so the idea of a big push was sort of again wasn't this idea to try to make a charge for break out and charge to Berlin it was just a break out of the trans systems getting to open warfare in the country beyond. I've just come out of Gordon Dump Cemetery. Um, if you've followed any of my previous videos, um, either the SOM videos or my Normandy 45 series that I did previously, you'll know I don't film inside the cemetery. I, it's a personal thing, I know some people do. I just find it a bit disrespectful. But what I know what I'll do. Um, I do take photos on my stills camera and then at the end of the video what I normally do is just put them up as a sideshow at the end so you can have a look at what the cemeteries look like it, yeah, I just feel that it's more respectful um, to take a still if you're walking around a military cemetery if, you, if you've got a stills camera rather than a video camera it just looks, um, just, it just feels it just feels right to, uh, to me um, so now we're just heading back up um, at the path from the cemetery, back up to the Contour Maison Road. We'll take a left, head back to the car, and then from there we'll drive down and hopefully find um, Dead Man's Lane and somewhere to pull over and we can have a little look up and down there. And then that will be the end of this episode. We're now up at the Pozier Cemetery. Uh, this cemetery is actually for the servicemen who were killed in the second battle of the Somme. So that's about to take place between March and August 1918. After the Germans have broken out following the Operation Michael or the Kaiser's, Bat Kaiser's Battle, that their last throw of the dice on the Western Front to try and win the war. And they can storm across, retake the land um, that the British had paid so much price for in blood in the in 1916, and then the British had to had to take it back again. But what we're doing now is we're coming back along the Albert Bapin Road because we're looking, we're coming along here to see if we can find this dead man's lane, which is where the troops of the 13th Rifle Brigade were attacking them, including my great grandfather. Now I'm looking there's a down here just before it dips down. Just after it dips down there's a hedgerow so I'd imagine it's possibly in there. Um, if you look across the other side you can see the imposing tip Val Memorial standing up. So as I'm walking along quite a main road, um, there's a lot of traffic. I'll turn it off until we get down there and see what we can find. Okay and here it is the infamous dead man's lane from the assault well um, it's a bit further down than I thought the map was showing but um, the map I've got probably is not the best one to scale in terms of um, 
in terms of accuracy. It's a very good map, but I, I quite like it. It's, um, it. it's a, it's more of like a picture map rather than a, um, rather than like an OS map. But it does get like it, it allows you to really understand the movements and the different lines and how it all fell back and where the cemeteries are in comparison. So I do actually really like it. So I'm not criticising that map for that, but yeah, it it was showing that the Dead Man's Lane was up there closer to that position but this sort of feels right although it did say it was a bit more sunken so I'm not too certain but yeah I'd say this is probably it it probably drips down a bit when we get there because when it was over at the summit we're looking across there's more of a hedgerow um, and also what you've got to can't think of is that we've had a hundred years of cultivation you know, if you follow the road down a little bit, down towards more level with Labour Cell, um, to give you an insight into just how much the landscape has been reclaimed by both nature and the farmers here. Another mine was blown opposite Labour Cell, similar to the Grand Crater, called Wysap. And that's been completely filled in, there is not a sign of it over there okay if you probably put a joint up at certain times of year you might be able to see an outline similar to the zigzags of the trenches um in some fields elsewhere but you wouldn't have found a great deal of in terms of if you were walking across it today you wouldn't know that there was a mine crater that sort of size down there so or was there at one point so the land has been reclaimed and has been and it has been altered so um, whether or not this is the exact spot um, is hard to say like I say it did suggest that it was from what I read it did suggest that it was more of a more sunken than this um, but then they may have had trenches behind so we'll have a wonder keep wandering down see what we can find um, if we reach Compton Maison, we know we've gone too far, and if there's no sign of it, we know um, that we're not in the right place. But certainly, if it isn't, then it just it does give you an idea of what that battalion was facing, because it would have been here, here or here, here bounced. Um, and actually, if you look back towards the cemetery where we came from. The land actually starts to dip a little bit, so the idea that Germans hiding the whole, holding the high ground here, again, no plantation there at the time, um, to sweep in field of fire, looking over that way off of this position would suggest that around here somewhere, um, I don't think it would have been too further far back that way um, because of that undulation in the ground as they had back towards the village of Pogier. Yeah. Um, so, and this would probably have been uh, maybe a bit of a seat line um, if we think that the German had the four lines of defence A, B, C and D. A was La Bacelle. Then you come back maybe B, C, Pozier, and then a further one further back. Um, so like I said, plus, I would estimate this is possibly a B or possibly even an intermediary uh, line where they're pushed out of one location, they come back, they find something that is reasonably defensible and they hold it. Um, yeah, there's certainly not any signs over there of another track coming along. Um, It's come to Maison, come to Maison is over there. Yeah, I can't see much more of a, a track. Um, in fact, it may have been a little bit closer that way. Um, just by the rise of that ridge, we followed those telegraph poles up. Um, so here would have been a rather obvious location. Um, I'm not going to go turn through much further because it doesn't feel like there's much need. Um, 
yeah there's certainly nothing looking back that way and like I say it, you, as you can see it, it dips off quite sharply from this point down um, so I'd imagine that this is this is the dead man's lane um, it certainly feels okay there's I think that anything else is heading that way it's going down um, it's yeah, starting to drop off uh, consummate on you can see some of the buildings down there now so yeah this is it this this is dead man's lane I'll, I'll, I'll imagine it to be more more sunken than this but like I say it's quite possible that this was a dug in dug in position given it's um and it's all the fire of course there's a little bit of a dip but um, for machine gunners that aren't actually fine for accuracy and just and, and just spraying then that that, um, that position would be reasonably um, useful so yeah this is it in my opinion this is the dead man's line and that and with that it concludes our walk of the estate of the Stoffing Rifle Brigade. Um, also they did make, they, they remake it up here. They got pushed out, um, mainly because of the fact that the supporting battalions had received the orders to discontinue their fight. Um, the first thing didn't. Um, so in reality, a lost opportunity to some extent. Um, with them making a success, successful attack, it wasn't a failure, it was only a failure due to not being resupported, similar, fairly similar to sorry to the Ulster Division on the 1st of July when they broke the break in at the Schwaben. The doubt that they, by getting cut off, the, um, the supporting battalions not making the Drepsis, they eventually have to fall back. Um, a similar thing happens here, and there's a number of reasons why. Um, the assault went ahead when all the others were cancelled. The most obvious being that the the runners didn't get through. Runners were one of the most um, targeted um, people by snipers, and it was a it was a dangerous job being a runner. And the, the most likely scenario would have been that the um, the rifleman who or the infantryman that was chosen to beat the runner to get through to the 13th battalion just didn't make it um, and so was then not given the order was then not passed to the nor to the commanding officer Dr Pliny to pull call off the assault so the assault was made and unfortunately a large number of casualties occurred um, which resulted in the Cotillo saying what OMS have made of my battalion one of the best battalions in the army so that's the story of the 13th Rifle Brigade and I must say it's been an absolute privilege for those to walk in the footsteps of my great grandfather who fought in that action and as we come back along Dead Man's Lane you see a lovely shot of the Tips Al Memorial rising up behind the woods on TFL Hacks. Now here at Dead Man's Road, so I've actually found it. Um, I originally went to somewhere a bit further to the, towards Albert, thinking that it wasn't as far up as Prosy is, but um, it's actually this is it. Um, and yeah it's much um, it's much more sunken than the place that I was up earlier. So this was the eventual assault point for the um, for the 13th Rifle Brigade. They actually managed to get up as far as this as part of that attack um, but as I said earlier that due to a breakdown in, communica in the communications line between the German, um, between the British command and the regiments, two of the supporting battalions didn't attack. So although they managed to get into this position into the German position up and around this road 
they were unable and they were forced back um, before and unable to consolidate that position. So that's why it's often seen as a futile attack because they didn't have the support. Um, and yet yeah, as we move along down here you can see why this would have been able to at that point of the battle um, been a fortified position. Um, it's um, with the um, as the banking on the side now starts to starts to pick up. If you look through the trees, you can see the edge of the um, the plantation that we was walking around earlier, and the line of the telegraph lot poles coming across. So that gives you an indication of as the direct line of assault because that is what we when we started walking out on earlier from that initial track that's what we walked out on so as we come down here we'll hopefully get some better quality pictures of it and yes you can definitely see now that the um just how steep it is in fact it's it it's quite fairly not quite as sunken but it, it's similar to the position up at Hawthorne up at the Hawthorne Ridge where um, the where the famous sunken road is and like I said at the time if, um, if you've watched that video um, if you look inside there actually there is some corrugated iron and things which are maybe old defence um, Oh, part of all defensive structures and stuff down here certainly isn't, it's um, nowhere near corroded enough, but the piece in there looks quite old and battered. Um, so yeah, as you come down here, it's starting to get reminiscent and sunken lanes in chalk areas are, aren't uncommon. So I don't, I don't expect you to think that when we say, oh, the sunken road it's an obvious there's lots of them in this area so that one becomes known as the sunken lane this one becomes known as dead man's lane and the reason why um, is that somewhere along along this track here um, a corpse was hanging on the remnants of a tree. Obviously a lot of the vegetation wouldn't have been here at the time. Um, that would have all have been shot and shelled away. Um, but the the sloped embankments so as you come down here, it's a natural trench, isn't it? It yes, okay, it's like it, it's slightly too wide if you're being pedantic about your engineering in terms of it's a lot easier to drop a shell into something this wide than a the standardised trench but if you're a infantryman you've been pushed out of your trench and you're falling back and you're trying to find some cover well this is certainly a lot better than the cover that you may than having to try and dig out cover from under a um, a fortification. So um, let's just try and see if we can get up here and have a look on what we're, as if we're looking over the parapet. Yes, and you can see now, although it's got a slight rise, you just see the top of the Prozier Cemetery over there, the line of the um, of the telegraph poles going across and then you've got the plantation that we came through so they've come up and over um, I would imagine that there was some form of intermediate defence line between here and here or that they actually they started a lot closer but again like I said like I said before many of these videos machine gun fires is a different is a different kettle of fish 
So with machine gun fire, what you're doing is you're, you're spraying an area, you're not looking for an individual target. So if there is someone moving across there, you're not trying to hit them. A British Vickers is a range of two and a half miles, the German Maxim is fairly similar. It's not accurate at that range. You're just putting a, num uh, a lot of bullets onto a, onto a square metre and hoping that it's going to hit somebody. So that's where we're looking at. So yeah, it's certainly... This is much more of what I was expecting from the descriptions of the Dead Man's Road and what they're coming up to than what they attacked into than what we saw. So I'm just going to go around this bend. I'm not going to walk all the way down into Contamaze on this. Um, we've got an idea of it now as to what it would have been like. De defending this and so like I say it is slightly wider but you they prob they would have um made adjustments to it as well um if you are defending it you you by the time you'd lob sandbags and other things down here that you need to make it more secure um more protected than that now I will come in and sometimes actually you do need yeah so you get down there a little bit further and it starts to drop from being sunken so this is the um this is the dead man's lane the final assault position of the 13th battalion the rifle brigade on the 10th of july 1916 so uh, i hope you've enjoyed this video and enjoyed following me walking the, this has been like I say, this one was being, this, this one's quite personal. Some of the other videos that I've done out here have just been using the books um, to follow specific interests of areas that I've known on the battlefield for a number of years. This time, I've actually managed to find one, or came across one where someone that I'm related to thought. So I'm honoured to have been able to do this little walk and. I really have enjoyed it and it's been a bit emotional at times um, but yeah I hope you've enjoyed it so like always if you like what you see hit the subscribe button hit the likes hit the shares um, send it around all over um, any groups that you're on etc uh, the more likes and hits I'll get the better so thank you very much for watching and I'll see you soon